Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience as we resolve this technical issue. Um, and I really wanted to thank you for joining us tonight for the screening of The Dry and for this Q&A with writer-director Robert Connolly. Robert, welcome. Thank you for taking this time with us. Lovely to chat to you, Mimi. Thank you for having me uh, for this Q&A and screening the film. Exciting. Okay. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to thank IFC again for sharing the film with uh, the members of Cinema Chicago and the Chicago International Film Festival. Also wanted to remind our audiences that if you have a question, please put it in the chat box and um, we will get to it, to as many questions as we can during the Q&A. So let's get started. Um, so Robert, I just wanted to start um, to talk about adaptation and that whole process. It's always been something that is particularly like interesting to me. It's both I think incredibly exciting. I mean, of course, very common, but it also poses a lot of challenges. But then when I think about the adaptation that you've done, which I think is done so incredibly well, when you're adapting a novel that's both a bestseller and also a mystery, there's all of these other kind of added layers of complication. You know, because it's a bestseller, of course, you know that there's these great, this great story to be told, but I think it, it came to you before it was a bestseller. Um, but of course, because it's a mystery, anybody that's read the novel knows how it ends and the mystery's already been solved. So there's this extra pressure to um, make the, the, the film engaging in a way that's very different from the novel um, and that keeps the audience engaged until the end when um, for an audience who hasn't seen it or read it, it's been revealed. So can you talk about um, working through these different um, issues and questions around adaptation? Yeah, it's a fascinating um, challenge. Uh, I was given the unpublished manuscript by my friend Bruno Papandreou, who's known in the US, Australian producer, but she produced Big Little Lies and Gone Girl and has a great eye for books. And she gave me the unpublished manuscript. I read it that night. I loved it. So yeah. compelling. I could feel the massive challenges of it, um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to have a go at it. I'd never adapted a detective mystery before. And, you know, the immediate challenge is two different time frames, two different crimes. Um, are they connected? Aren't they uh, necessary plotting of um, suspects? And when you reveal information, everyone's got a secret. Is it a secret from each other or from the audience? Um, but our guiding principle for the whole adaptation was that plot is the engine room of the small screen. You know, we watch so much stuff. We watch amazing Scandi Noir, the British and the US, amazing detective mysteries as well on TV. And cinema is different. You know, it allows you to, to apply a microscope to the human condition and look inside characters. And so our guiding principle was to get the plot working, but not to serve the plot only. You know, to something Eric Banner and I talked a lot about was how to detail this character. And so the adaptations challenges actually became more about uh, an emotional challenge. Mm. How do we take the audience on a journey, um, a cathartic journey of okay. this, this man who has something profoundly unresolved in his past? And, and, you know, this theme of if the truth is known, you can move on in your life. And, and so with that guiding principle um, at hand, we thought we could make a film that people who knew the book and knew the plot, people who didn't know the book and didn't know the plot, would both feel an emotional journey um, that transcended the, me the mechanism of plot with no disrespect to plot. It's just that I think cinema has to lift into some other t territory um, uh, to, to be a distinctive experience for an audience now with so much great work on the small screen. Absolutely. I mean, so it's really interesting how I feel like um, you really, I guess, leaned into a kind of character and character development, um, particularly ar around um, the character of Aaron Falk. Um, but also um, he's surrounded by kind of this really interesting kind of web of characters um, that, that, that support that emotion. But um, so maybe talk a little bit about developing out the character of Aaron Falk in a way that um, was particularly cinematic um, um, that really made this, this story or this emotional journey work. Yeah, no, that's really the guts of it. If I didn't have Eric, <laughs> I, well, I needed an amazing actor. Yeah. Um, who could play, and I needed an amazing actor to play the young Aaron Ford. Yeah. You know, this incredible actor, Joe Klodczyk, who plays the younger um, years of that character. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's that challenge of, like, 
how much you can allow the audience to fill in the blanks. It's one of the things I love about working with Eric. He, he's not interested in, you know, the pyrotechnics of acting or the demonstrative aspects of acting. You know, he's interested in just truthful, honest moments and trust the, the audience can look into the character and piece together things as opposed to him having to demonstrate it to you as an audience. And so that's something we talked a lot about. I mean, there were times when I wasn't sure if we were being too subtle or whether we needed to push things a little bit more. Or, um, but he's such a gifted um, actor and I think there's little moments that have a layer of detail and that definitely give you kind of insights into the character but allow you as an audience to work it out as well, which right. is something that I that I love myself in going to the movies. I don't like to be um, force-fed narrative and drama. I, I like to, I think, what is it Billy Wilder said, if you let the audience work out that one plus one equals two, they'll love you forever. <laughs> and I think that's a guiding principle as a, as a director. It's like, am I adding it up for the audience and treating them like idiots? Right, right. Um, which I, I hope the audience tonight feels that we left enough available to the audience to find their own way through the story. Yeah, I mean, and it's really interesting, like you said, um, I think particularly the way that Eric in this in this role is Aaron is playing it, there's so much, um, I think in the entire film that is like surface versus like kind of what's kind of simmering underneath. And I think we see that in his physicality as well as in his eyes, um, but also in the aesthetics that you choose for the film um, and that it, it it's a proper mystery in that there's kind of this like, I think this unease um, or this feeling of being unsettled that runs throughout the film. So if you could talk a little bit about the aesthetic choices that you are making to produce this, um, this sense of unease that we feel as yeah. well. Yeah, it's a challenge, you know, to, you know, we, we talked a lot about trying to create a, 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 a sense for the audience that the film's always leaning forward that right. you're falling forward into the story deeper and deeper and deeper and 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 um, and how then do you make the audience feel this uneasy sense of something you, that you're falling towards and I think the key to that was the contrast between past and present yeah. moving between these two time frames and uh, my cinematographer Stefan Dusho is um, known in the US more recently for The Invisible Man and he, he's a young cinematographer doing incredible work and and he and I kind of played with this idea that the past would be looser and rougher and more fragmented and you wouldn't get all the information because that's how we remember the past. And, right. and that the contemporary story would be more classical in its uh, use of composition and camera movement. And, and so to try and create this unease of moving through these classical compositions and moving, and then you're in the past and you're kind of lost in a maelstrom of memory and, um, and the push and pull of those top two time frames you know, hopefully created that unease as well as that leaning forward quality that we were we were reaching for. Yeah, and actually we have an audience question about this and the audience says the cinematography was beautiful and the flashbacks look like they were maybe filmed on 35 millimeters. So definitely like, like you said, you're looking for a different aesthetic with the past, um, both with the camera movement, the color palette, and maybe the lens choice, I'm guessing. So can you talk about yeah that like process and what else kind of was part of that aesthetic as well and working with your DP on that. Yeah, we shot the, uh, we shot on a new uh, large format camera system, the Panavision's in Venice. So it's large format, which is, I think it's the first Australian feature to shoot that way. And, and that came out of also our view that how do you make people come to the cinema? How do you make it different? Um, and then we shot the contemporary story on some very modern, hyper sharp um, lenses, um, large format lenses. And whereas the past we shot on some 1970s lenses, okay. some older yeah. glass that just has the light refracts in a slightly different way. Um, but as your audience member picked up, the, the grain in the film. So we actually explored a, a US company called Live Grain that has filmed all the old film grains. Um, it's incredible meticulous work they've done. And so we applied to the contemporary story a very fine 35 mil grain. Um, and the past, we applied a 16 mil grain, which was okay. the camera that, you know, my early films, Balibo, and that they were all shot on 16 mil. I still 
just love that format. I think it's amazing. Yeah. So that's why it has a, it has more grain. And and although it's a photochemical device that we mm. were emulating, I think it's the same as when you know I've got eighteen and sixteen year olds, and they're all into shooting on film at the moment. Yeah. And they all think you look so much better on thirty five mil film, and, and they're right. Um, <laughs> But I, I wanted you always to know you were in the past. I, mm. I didn't want any doubt. I wanted people to know I'm in the past. It's grainier. It's more handheld. Uh, in terms of the colour palette, uh, in the contemporary story, we tried to remove the colour green completely. Mm. And in the past, it's rich with green. In the sound design, in the past, you hear running water, you hear bird life. In the contemporary story, you don't hear any birds. You, you know, So there were all of these decisions to create that... Um, push and pull at mm. past, yeah. you know, culminating like, in, you know. The, yeah, I mean, and obviously, like, the audience here is catching that on a, a smaller screen, perhaps, or maybe watching it in their own um, home um, theater setup. But, you know, especially, I think, with the sound design, that's something where you go to the theater and you can really kind of sense that, uh, you, well, you hear the difference. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I mean, people have an amazing, amazing ability to watch things at home now on very big screens, and um, and you know it's a very tricky time for cinema. And but you know we all know how much we're going to love going back to the cinema when they're all open and available to us. It's um, it's certainly um, you know we're social animals. Yeah. We like we like experiencing things collectively. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things that you're talking about, is, of course, with um, the past and the present is also like the setting um, and that it's shot in Victoria um, in a fictional town that's that's gone through a, a long period of drought. Um, but, um, you know, I think the landscapes are so striking in the film as well, whether it's the past or the present. Um, so I was like, could you talk about kind of that location in Victoria? Um you know, finding that particular drought-stricken area, um, you know, how that, I guess, contributes to, because I think very symbolically, the idea of the drought feeds into what's happening in this town, you know, this lack of, um, you know, maybe like truth, uh, lack of trust, um, not just the lack of water, um, maybe, and perhaps a lack of hope, yet there's this kind of like steeliness and this other sensibility that's competing with that. But that's also kind of has a hardness to it. So one is like, if you could talk about finding the location in Victoria, and I guess push and pull between the symbolic of, of what that um, location means with actually what's happening right now um, in terms of that. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting filming about four and a half hours drive from here in Melbourne where my office is. It's our, it's like the food bowl of the mm -hmm. state. Um, it's experienced terrible drought. There, when we were filming, there was the threat of bushfire and much as it is in the, uh, in the, the film. Um, and, you know, Jane Harper's books all deal with landscape and right. it, they deal with landscape in like a metaphoric way, you know, mm -hmm. as well as a literal way. And, you know, Aaron Falk standing in this empty river and remembering that he used to swim there as a kid and and it revealing some aspect of the psychology of the character that he's playing and where his head's at. But also, you know, I'm deeply troubled by um, uh, issues of climate change and I think Australia's done a pretty poor job of trying to deal with it and understand it and realise how complicit we are in it. And, and um, so I... I I loved also that the film has always pervades the entire narrative, this idea of climate change and and this world, this regional world that is changing. But certainly for me, taking the film crew there, being based there, living there, making the film, using locals, getting it it, it allows the film to get inside your DNA or the film's DNA. It's mm -hmm. it's um, yeah, no, it was an it was an amazing experience. Because tough as that landscape is, it's incredibly beautiful as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I thought of it as like awesome in all senses of the word and that it's like both something that's extraordinary and captivating and, and breathtaking, but also something that's quite intimidating and, and there's something like fearsome about it. Um, and I think you capture both aspects of that quite well with the way that you shoot the landscape. 
Oh, that's good. Yeah, that was the hope. That, yeah. You know, we were trying not to judge that world. Yeah, it's really interesting that there's a big theme in the film of some people stay and some people move on from where they grew up. And and I, I didn't want. To, I grew up in the bush and I left um, when I was 15. But some friends stayed, and I, I didn't want the film to judge that world. There's a version of the film where it could have been like Deliverance. Yeah, you know, a guy from the city goes out, and all these scary people that live in there reach in the outback australia does those films really well um <laughs> but, but that wasn't my, i wasn't interested in that story right. I, I was interested in a more visceral and truthful story about people doing it tough right. and uh, doing tough on the land right so we have another a couple more audience questions one is just like about the like did you film this actually during the pandemic or when so when was it when was the film shot uh, we just finished shooting before the pandemic, actually, okay. but we did post-production during the pandemic. So, okay. yeah, um, but we had finished the shoot, um, thankfully, yeah. Um, before. Yeah. And then also this goes back to kind of that question of adaptation, and you said you had access to the manuscript of the book before it was published, so you didn't know it was going to be a bestseller, but you knew there was, like, no. a great story at the heart of it. But what, not, not knowing it was a bestseller, what attracted you personally to the book? Um, I think the uh, the world of it, yeah. you know, the landscape, the, the metaphoric use of landscape and weather, and 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 also this incredible character landscape. You know, these amazing array of characters, all very varied and different in age and um, experience, all carrying secrets. I mean, I love the plot. I love the two crimes, and I also thought I could create a film that would be fun for an audience to work yeah. out who did it. Can you solve the crime before the detective? Right, right. What are the but I but I think probably probably landscape landscape yeah. first. I thought, wow, this is a world that hasn't really been depicted properly in Australian cinema, mm -hmm. and a chance now to show an audience in the United States um, a world that is very familiar to me. It's quite yeah. a gift in my career that. The work can transcend the location and the country that it was made in. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I want to go back because since you just brought it up again about this question of the double mystery that's being um, solved. You know, of course, there's the one, the contemporary one that he's actively participating in, but then the one from his past and kind of navigating that that tension between between the two and is you know solving one contingent on the other, which is always the question that the audience is watching, but also kind of the fun of the red herrings, right? And so how did you kind of navigate kind of that structure um, and, um, you know, like that tension and making sure that the audience had enough to keep them engaged, but not so much that, you, you know, nobody wants to solve the mystery in the first, uh, you know, half of the film. Yeah, it's really challenging. I'd never done this genre before. And I, I think a screenplay is written three times you okay. know, on the page during the shoot and in the edit. And I would be I would be lying if I said we cracked the script in the, on the page. You know, there were lots of issues during the shoot. And in the edit, we had to reshoot a few things. And it was very complicated to achieve what you're talking about and um, test screenings and just trying to make sure, you know, when do people work it out? Were people emotionally fulfilled? You know, this old adage that something in a, in a film should be a surprise to the audience, but yeah. the minute it's a surprise, it, you should go, oh, it's the only possible thing that could have happened. Mm -hmm. So there's no point just having a surprise and then the audience it's, goes, well, I could never have worked that out. It has to be a surprise and you have to go, oh, I wish I'd been paying more attention or or people leave and some, you know, that's what happened in Australia. It was a massive hit here and people would leave and one of the, a couple would go and say, oh, I got it five minutes in and the yeah. other one was going, you couldn't have got it, for, you know, and that, and so I, I heard people debating when and how and, but, you know, it's tricky because audiences are so literate now about yeah. this genre because of the small screen um, work that is on all the streaming services. It's so good, yeah. so which is why it needed to transcend that and be emotional and transport you to a world that was fresh. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question about kind of about landscape and past and present is this from the audience. And how did you shoot the past with the water in the river and then the present with the river dried up? Um, was it a different stream, a different location or uh, did you use special yeah. effects? Yeah, it was pretty tricky. Um, we, we, if, for anyone who's interested, and they can Google the places. <laughs> so 
we filmed in a town, Warwick Nabil, for the dry part and all the satellite towns in the Wimmera, Mallee area of Victoria. So Warwick Nabil is where Australian musician Nick Cave was born. It's middle of nowhere, dry, drought. We filmed the past in a, around a town called Castle Main, which is two hours north of here. And that had a, a river um, that had water in it um, that we found a section of that felt very similar to the shape of the empty river that we found. So it, it, there's no VFX, um, but it is a, a tricky kind of juggle. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think I think it works. I think it works also because of all those other elements we were doing with grain and color and everything to distinguish the past and present as well. But uh, it was a big challenge. The same with the rock tree. How do you have this rock tree? It's full. It's green and it's alive. And then you right. come back twenty years later and now it's dead. How do you do that? So. Um, that was incredibly tricky with the whole grains unit. And, um, yeah, so no, a, a challenge, a yeah. challenge, always past and present. I didn't want it to be um, disconcerting for an audience. I wanted the audience just to, to go with it. And the same with the older actors and younger actors. I didn't want people to go, oh, they don't look like them. Or they, you know, I just wanted it to feel effortless. Yeah. So we did spend a lot of a lot of time on all of these things. Yeah, I mean the casting I think is amazing and how you achieve that with the younger actors and the older actors. Um, yeah, I mean it's right. easy to make that yeah. connection where you're not like thinking like you said too much about it. Um, yeah, and I mean I wanted to go back to one other thing that you talked about, like you know how much was adjusted in the editing because I do think that's probably why like kind of the way that you seamlessly move between past and present is so effective and I feel like you had to probably spend a really long time editing the film to kind of get that precise kind of the timing of, of the, the past scenes and how they fit yeah. into the present. Yeah, it's so complicated. It's a um, uh, six month long edit. Yeah. Two different editors, uh, Alexander DeFranceschi who edited the Australian film Lion okay. uh, with Jeff Patel, uh -huh. another editor, Nick Myers, who's edited my films Paper Planes and um, Balibo. You know, it was just tricky, really tricky, but fun. But it was like a puzzle, a cricket yeah. puzzle. And yeah. it's that, you know, I love across my career working in different genres. Mm -hmm. And so the detective mystery was a uh, challenge. For those of you who know the books, I'm, I've been reading this today. This is the sequel to The Dry. Okay. So I'm writing my notes all through this, trying to work out if I can make a sequel to The Dry. <laughs> it's another, it's the same detective, Aaron Fall. Yeah. Uh, but it's set in a different part of it. It's more Australian bush. Yeah. Scrub and um, subtropical um, bush. So uh, again, Jane Harper's books all deal with different natural environments. So. And uh, again, with quite a metaphoric relationship between the landscape and the psychology of the character. Yeah, and um, did how involved was Jane with, with the film? Uh, she read drafts, she saw edits, um, just delighted that she loves the film because you know, when I screened it for finished, I was terrified. Because you know, you take a writer, it's her first book. Right. So she's never going to care about any book as much. It's, it's right. launched her career. It's a New York Times bestseller. She's right. So, um, but no, she was fantastic actually. And I think her readers and everyone feel that the, uh, uh, and her fans feel that the film is true to what her intention was. It certainly helped us when we released the film in Australia to have Jane Harper tell all the fans she liked it. Yeah. Um, because that would, that would have worked against our better interests, I'm sure. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> Great, um, I wanna get back to kind of, you know, cause you've worked across genres about your storytelling style and your approach to storytelling, whatever the genre is. So when I told another programmer friend that we were gonna be talking tonight or this afternoon for you, um, she had let me know that she'd done Q and A's with you at other festivals before and just said how she found you to be so incredibly warm and kind. And also I've read kind of comments from your cast and crew that they gush about um, your generosity and, and also kind of your kind heartedness. So, you know, the dry is there. Yeah, the dry is <laughs> <laughs> that's filled though with this darkness, tragedy, the secrets, the lies. But in the end, I feel like it's also a tale of really about forgiveness and redemption. And I was just wondering if you would talk about kind of your humanistic approach to storytelling. Yeah, that look, I 
kind of highly inspired as a young filmmaker by the Australian filmmaker Peter Weir mm-hmm. and his films from Gallipoli, Picnic at Hanging Rock, The Year of Living Dangerously particularly, and then his American work from Witness On. Um, and I think he's one of the great humanist filmmakers. You know, these filmmakers who are really interested in looking into the human condition through cinema right. and illuminating some aspect of the human condition, sometimes social, political agenda in the work, but, but ultimately always like a forensic look at us. And, and I feel like it's a gift that I've been given to be a filmmaker. I get to make films. and. So I carry that responsibility quite heavily too. And there's such tragedy in uh, the dry, um, in its narrative and what happened to Ellie. And um, But what did I want to leave the audience with? I wanted to leave the audience with a kind of sense that, that when, when the truth is known, you know, we can move on and, you know, there's... You know, it's all about kind of reconciliation. You know, you resolve something in yourself or within a community and then you've healed some part of it despite the tragedy. Yeah. Um, so they were in things that were of interest to me with the dry, um, plus the, the climate change issues. And But, yeah, so it's, it's amazing. I've had this career and I've been able to, to make films over 25 years and, and hopefully they're a jigsaw puzzle of different points of view and... And they've definitely got richer since I, you know, I mean, I began my career, I've got 18 and 16 year old daughters now. When I made my first film, I had no kids, I was single, you know, you'd hope that my films would be better now. <laughs> that's, the, that's the theory. <laughs> no, and I also think it's really interesting. So I've been look, for, look forward to the sequel. Like, you know, you, I think one of the things that I love about the film too, is it takes like this, this trope of the troubled detective, which we often find, um, you know, in detective stories or mysteries, but kind of turns it on his head. But, you know, now that he's come to terms with his past, like what's next for Aaron Falk? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you have to read that. And she's writing the third book, so it's a trilogy. It's like Australia's yeah. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trilogy. Really. Um, and I think, I think the next book, you know, I'm finding a way into it. You know, I grew up in the Blue Mountains outside Sydney and my childhood was in the Australian bush and it's something for maybe some of your your viewers today have been to Australia, but it's quite formidable, you know. Yeah. It's it's full of the most deadly spiders, snakes, you know, it's prone to bushfires, you know, it's it's a difficult terrain to navigate, but it's also really beautiful and um and it it's one of those things if you learn and respect it, you can inhabit it and really enjoy it. But if you're disrespectful of it and you come from an urban world and you, you it can it can take you mm. it can consume you and and yeah. um and so i think the second film is appealing to me because it really kind of looks into into the australian bush in a way that i, I don't think there's many films that have done that before so so that's the plan anyway that's that's what I'm dabbling, dabbling with today in the office. <laughs> Great. Well, we look forward to it. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here. Um, and uh, thank you, a big thank you again to IFC. A uh, reminder to everyone that the film will be released this Friday, May 21st in theaters. And if you love the film, spread the word. Um, thank it's you. It's lovely so to chat to you. Thank well, you. I, was, we, I love that we were discussing earlier that I began my career with my first short film playing at your film festival and the first film prize I ever won was from your festival in 1995. <laughs> so it's lovely to chat to you today. Lovely to meet you and talk with you too and we'll uh, have to get you to Chicago someday soon. I'm, I'm there. Count me in <laughs> when I can travel again. Thank All right. you. Thank you everyone for watching today. It's really lovely. Thank you.